All right, to follow up on the cephalosporin and penicillin discussion, I'm going to throw out a couple of cases here uh, that might that are kind of exemplify a typical thought process that goes on in the clinical setting. And this is something that um, doesn't always occur. Sometimes um, it, it doesn't happen, but it should happen. This is the thought process that, that we should go through. So when we're talking about empiric therapy, we want to cover the likely organisms. When we're talking about uh, once we have a microbiological report that gives us a clear picture of what the true pathogen is, we don't have to cover all the empiric pathogens anymore. So let's take the first example. We'll take a 42-year-old uh, white male who um, comes into the hospital with a fever of 102 degrees. Um, he uh, is uh, weak, uh, dizzy, um, and uh, chills. And uh, this has been going on for, for uh, several days now. And he is a known uh, IV drug abuser. And so uh, when we do a physical exam, we hear a murmur on the, uh, on the, on the cardiac exam. And so <clears throat> uh, one of the things that you're going to do very early on is you're going to do uh, blood cultures times two. And hopefully you do those before you start antibiotics. Um, this guy is obviously going to need antibiotics. Um, but with the, uh, the murmur, oh, and let's just um, say that we went ahead and did an echocardiogram, um, and, we, and we did that uh, a transesophageal echocardiogram, and that showed a uh, vegetation on the which heart valve? The right uh, tricuspid valve. And so this is right-sided endocarditis, and so we need to cover empirically the likely bugs. So you need to cover staph, you need to cover strep, and really you can't assume it's methicillin sensitive staph, so you've got to cover MRSA. So you're going to start with vancomycin. And um, uh, I don't know what the guidelines say because I don't work inpatient anymore, but uh, some people might start ceftriaxone to cover uh, gram negatives. Um, that's not the important point. The point is to know what the likely organisms are in your hospital and cover them. So this is something that you're going to start. But uh, uh, 36 hours later, the lab calls with blood cultures both showing strep, well, let's say um, alpha hemolytic streptococci. And so you know, because you remember this, that that's either strep pneumo or strep viridans. And which of those causes endocarditis? Strep viridans, exactly. So this is a strep viridans endocarditis. Do you need vancomycin to cover uh, strep viridans? No. Is vancomycin the most active drug against strep viridans? No. So you can switch that over to IV penicillin. And in fact, that would occur Sometimes we don't do the narrowing of the spectrum. This is good medicine, and if anybody knows what they're doing, that's what they're going to do. This is something that is going to happen in the clinical setting. All right, so that's example number one. Let's take uh, one other example to kind of exemplify using what we now know uh, about cephalosporins and penicillins. Let's take a case of uh, 50 seven-year-old COPD patient who's been hospitalized now for a week and develops pneumonia. So how do we know they've got pneumonia? Worsening cough, now productive of, of purulent, purulent sputum. Uh, you can hear changes on the uh, auscultation. You're going to see uh, an infiltrate that wasn't there on an admission that is now there on chest x-ray and you know that it's an pneumonia, but you don't know what bug it is.
Okay, so what bugs do we need to cover? Well, you always need to cover strep pneumo, even though this is a hospital-acquired pneumonia. Um, strep pneumo still is a player. You need to cover, because it's hospital-acquired, uh, gram negatives. Um, and this guy is very sick, and we're going to cover Pseudomonas. And you probably need to cover staff as well, because hospital-acquired pneumonias, staff can be a significant player as well. And if you're in the hospital, now you're stuck covering MRSA. So now you have to cover with this incredibly huge um, uh, spectrum of antibiotics. If, if, if this came on very acutely and he's very sick, it's probably not. Um, atypicals like mycoplasma, legionella. Some people would cover for that, some people wouldn't, uh, because this is my case, we're not gonna. And so, uh, we're gonna cover this with uh, cefepine. And plus, um, Vanco. This is for the MRSA, this is for the pseudomonas, the other nasty gram negatives, and cefepine still has an adequate gram positive to cover strep pneumo. Um, you would never use this for like a community acquired pneumonia because it's not the best drug for strep pneumo, but I think in this case you, it's a reasonable choice to for empiric coverage. Remember, you always need to keep distinct in your mind empiric coverage versus specific we know what we're treating coverage. So once we, uh, we as soon as you start, before you start the antibiotic therapy, you get a sputum. And the sputum, um, you can gram stain it, which gives you some idea what the predominant organism is, and then you culture it. So let's say the gram stain shows um, uh, 40 WBCs per high power field, five epithelial cells per high power field, this suggests that this is a good sputum, finding, getting where the pneumonia is without very much mouth uh, spit contaminating it. And so we're going to believe this, and it shows gram-negative rods. So we know we've pretty much covered gram-negative rods, but we don't know what it is that we're treating here. Two days later, we grow out enterobacter. Bacter is a gram-negative rod, not to be confused with enterococcus, which is a gram-positive cocci. And if we had enterococcus, we'd be in a world of hurt, right? Because no cephalosporin covers enterococcus. I suppose the banco probably would, would, would cover us there. All right, so now that we know that we have enterobacter, we don't need cefepine. And you don't want to float cefepime around in the blood and wave it at whatever pseudomonas might be there to teach it how to become resistant down the road. We want to keep cefepime as our go-to uh, anti-pseudomonal cephalosporin. So we're going to stop cefepime and vanco because we now know it's not staph. We don't want to cover pseudomonas and we're going to down, scale down, de-escalate antibiotic therapy to ceftriaxone assuming that the sensitivities show that the enterobacter is sensitive, which in this case it did. So that is kind of the way that you do things. I think for enterobacter, it's a fairly creative bug. Some people might want to cover it with two drugs. That's, uh, that's a discussion you can have with Dr. Van Lu or somebody who does inpatient medicine, not me. I want you to understand empiric therapy. We know this covers pseudomonas and then we know this doesn't cover MRSA, and so we add Vanco. When we have a, a, a identify a bug that's not Pseudomonas, we can then switch uh, to ceftriaxone. So those are the concepts that, that I want you to get just for a clinical point, since this is integrated pharmacotherapy. Um, I think those are points that help emphasize what we talked about with penicillins and cephalosporins. Thank you very much.